So let's talk about density and how uh, that affects people and how um, it can be a force for good, especially uh, when people become um, almost disemboweled from their communities. Sometimes one needs this connection with other people in order to feel part of something. And I think density is one of those things that really allows you to uh, come together with other people in a natural way. But clearly, I think the important thing for uh, designers in the built environment is to try and make sure that density is something that is done with a human touch to understand what it means that uh, allows people to be much more themselves in that very complex and modern environment. So therefore, I think it needs a certain uh, understanding of how we as human beings are in terms of our adju adjustment to our environment. Partly, I would call upon uh, the ideas of biophilia, for example, where greenery relaxes people, uh, brings people back to their uh, original uh, context as, as, uh, as social animals in, a, in, a, in an environment. And so therefore density has to be married with green space. Density quite often is seen as tall buildings, and I think that um, isn't necessarily always the answer. You can have quite well-designed low-rise buildings, let's say seven or eight storeys rather than 30 or 40 storeys, and get the same densities in a part of the city. Um, what's important is the spaces between those buildings and how they uh, allow people to meet each other, especially at ground floor level. And that's where a lot of the green space, I think, sits most happily. However, as one moves into um, Eastern uh, Asia, for example, where density has been um, embraced far more in recent years, um, that green space starts to appear higher up the buildings. So at rooftops, in balconies, uh, and in spaces where, for example, we would normally want to walk between spaces at ground floor level, but we can possibly also move between spaces at first, second or third floor level in large um, streets in the sky. Now that goes back to some of the Corbusian attitudes about modern architecture, which failed, of course, in those post-war years where planning took over and economics again uh, struck a poor chord and developed environments in which the human being was ignored. However, today, as we green our spaces, as we understand the way that people work together and socialize with, with each other, we can now develop a far better understanding of how people come together in order to make sure that they become part of a greater community and do not become lonely. When one moves into a building, there's also an important aspect of the design where for example, if you've got a number of floors, each floor, the number of spaces that you have between each of the doors is important. And also I would say the number of front doors around each of those spaces has to be limited. In order for people to socialise and to understand and to know their neighbours, they need to really work within a, a maximum of eight front doors within a space. Even better, six or five. That way, people see, tend to be encouraged to talk to each other more. They will stop in the spaces where the doors all congregate and just get to know each other better and therefore build relationships. In, in homes where there are long distant corridors, where there are multiple front doors, there's a reluctance for people to meet and talk to each other. On a tube train you feel alone even though you're with lots and lots of people. And, and that is because it's um, sometimes seen as a very um, difficult environment in, in terms of it's a negative environment. Uh, you don't know anybody, there's too many of them, and you just want to look down or put your, put your earphones on and listen to your iPhone or, or whatever. You, you disenfranchise yourself from society the more there are in a, built, in a, in a space. So there is a, a balance between the number of people in a space, which which is a sort of a, a, depending on the space. I mean, you know, for example, we design uh, city uh, squares not to be too big. 
not to be too big in order to allow there to be a reasonable amount of density in there. So I think people enjoy going to places that are lively and buzzy and exciting. And that makes for uh, an attractive and interesting place. And more often than not, um, when it comes to the economics of building space, the more footfall you have, the better economic value there is in that space, especially in a retail environment or a leisure environment. There are a lot of studies now being done um, by very various research groups uh, about the way in which uh, people travel through space. So the science of the neuroscience that is now coming out uh, of a lot of institutions, where we are we are gathering data around footfall in cities. So why do people enjoy one space rather than another? So we can gather data to see how many people go into one space rather than another. We can gather that statistically and say, here are some numbers that show that. But what we don't know is necessarily why. So we need to then go the next step and actually either ask them specifically why, or do a separate analysis on that space and actually understand, is it that beautiful green tree? Is it something to do with a little coffee shop in the corner that's always got sunshine on it? that makes it a great place to be. What is it? So I think you can design social spaces around both analytical uh, neuroscience-based um, analysis and um, physical, visual, just standing there and looking at what people do, and then write that down. Um, I think there's also a lot of space now for big data. So we gather data from our cell phones. You can Google, etc. all of them do this. So I know that certain universities are now gathering footfall data in order to do big analyses of how cities work and how people move around them or where, where is it good to be and where is it bad to be. So to aid the designer and also to, to, to help sell, if you will, um, what you're doing by giving it some sort of a mathematical rigour. Uh, allows a designer to, to quantify and give uh, some sort of realistic data to why something is better than something else. And therefore you can actually find why people socialise more, meet each other more and become uh, less disenfranchised from each other. We, in this, in the UK for example, Northern Europe generally, um, where there isn't actually enough sunlight, and it's sunlight that's important, not daylight, sunlight is important, where actually doctors are saying you should take vitamin D tablets every day. Just do it, because that is the one thing that's going to give you the coverage that you need. And so, yeah, negativity, um, mood, uh, general health and well-being uh, is an impact by a lack of sunlight. And so, I know it sounds you know, a, a bit synthetic, but taking that a bit of a deep habit is actually quite a good thing. We've got a piece to it. This, this idea of why people sometimes become disenfranchised from public space. So the big reason is uh, safety and security. If people are safe and secure when they come into a public space, they're more likely to dwell there and stay there. And this is, this is a real problem, I think, as, as um, the population become older they become less secure in themselves. They become more frail. They're less able to look after themselves and therefore they need even greater surety that the spaces that they're in are safe for them. And there's been a lot of studies around the way in which people actually, sounds a bit strange, but live longer lives if they can occupy safe space. And that's because if they do use these spaces, they first and foremost walk and become physically active. So that's a positivity for health for me. Secondly, they become socially more active because they talk to people. They make friendships and connections. And that makes them feel positive about themselves as if, actually, I'm part of something. I'm in a community, I've got friends, I have a value. And too often loneliness can result in people feeling they have no value. And it is that, ultimately, that brings them down, you know, into suicide, into living on the streets, 
into a spiral of decay, which I think we can change by designing great spaces. Now, I'm coming from that perspective. Clearly, the bigger political, socio-economic agenda that sits outside of that manifests itself far more greatly on that than what I'm saying. But let's just talk about that context, because it in itself is a positive factor for good. The job that you do isn't necessarily fulfilling you. You need something else that does fulfill that role. But if you're, if you're working all day and you have no time, you come home, you eat, you go to bed, you get up and you go back to work, then that's not going to fulfill that gap that you quite rightly talk about. Interestingly, in, in Copenhagen at the moment, there are a number of companies that have decided that they're going to be doing six-hour days. And those six-hour days, it's now been um, uh, statistically analysed, as being far more productive than eight-hour days. So people come in, they have the energy and the willpower, they know they've only got that time, and they just do the job quicker, more efficiently, and better. They then have those two extra hours to go and do other things that they wish to do, which results in them being happier, improving their health and well-being, of course, and their social interactivity with each other. So the benefit is community-wide, not just for themselves. And interestingly enough, um, in, in the sort of almost the pre-war years in Europe, a lot of a lot of people had small holdings at home. So they had a small a little field or small backyard, and they perhaps had a couple of pigs or whatever it was, some chickens. Um, and they would work from six in the morning until one in the afternoon. And then they'd go home and work on their small holiday. So they then had, in a sense, two, two sources of income. They did stuff for everybody and then stuff for themselves. And if they were entrepreneurial enough, they could find that their little small holding grows and they do something with it. And that's in itself, that has gone. Now we're owned now by the corporates. They own our lives, you will do this at this time with us there. Now, that in itself is also changing. And you could argue that our digital environment is allowing us to be more flexible. However, my view is that you're at work 24-7. You take that digital piece of kit with you, call the iPhone, whatever it is, and you're at work all the time. It dings, it dongs, oh my god, but what's that? Go look at it. It's two in the morning. Oh my god, I've just been woken up by this ding. So you're always on parade. And I think that's, that's something that we actually personally should all manage ourselves better, i.e. put it away, do not look at it when you are not on, you know, at work. But that's quite hard, because it's also our social tool, not just our work tool, our social tool. So either you have two phones, one's your work one, one's your social one, or you, you have to just get on with it. So. so I think this disenfranchisement, this sort of the, the ability for digi the digital network to connect people also disconnects them. Because quite often, the physical interaction that actually we as human beings really, really need is sublet out to a digital connectivity and is considered by some to be enough, and it actually isn't. You need the physical connectivity in order to fulfill the relationships that you've started with others, possibly on, in a digital environment young people still go out, they go to the pub, they go to you know, somewhere to dance, whatever it is, um, they do go out and meet each other. However, there are an increasing number, clearly, that, and I'd call this the socially disadvantaged uh, kids in our inner cities, or not even in our inner cities, some of our rural environments are equally uh, challenging, who have been completely disconnected from the world that they live in. They can't afford, when they grow up, grow up to, to have a house because they've got no money because they haven't got a job or, or they've got a, cheap, a job that's not paying them enough. They're living with their parents until their mid-30s because they can't afford a, a mortgage or the rent. Um, it, it's become a real crisis now for young people and I think this is where the big job needs to be done. And, and not just young people, I mean children at the age from 11 onwards Really, one needs to capture them at that point in society and start to help guide them properly into what is their future and help them find their future. And you know, schools and, and, and absolutely parents. Parents at the heart of the problem is parents, parenting. We have some, in some environments, 
forgotten how to be parents and what that job actually means. It's, it's offloaded almost to society to do it for us and it's not the case. We should be doing our own parenting. A lot of, a lot of, of, of what it is that we aspire to and it is an aspiration of society that we live in demands a, a, a two salary income otherwise you just can't live. You can't go on holiday with one person not working. Uh, you can't afford the rent or you can't afford the mortgage that you've got because you need two salaries. You're based on two salaries, so what, so what do you do then? And then I know, in, uh, from, obviously in, in London, where things are so much more expensive, putting a child into a nursery is a, is a wage in itself. You know, some people want to work. They want to sit at home with kids all the time. They just, they, they, they want both, both worlds, you know, and especially women, absolutely can't be, you know, told, in a sense, by society, oh, that oh, you shouldn't be doing that, you should be at home with your children. Well, sorry, that's, that's, that's dead and buried, mate. We have to be honest. We, equality is the key. Men, if they wish to stay at home, should be encouraged to do that, if that's what they wish to do. But equally, if both we wish to go well, we need a, a, a social network in which young children and young adults sometimes need to be uh, uh, felt, feel safe and, and, and included. The societal ills are bigger than the spaces, as I said earlier, bigger than the spaces in which you live. They are sometimes an economic output of the environment in which you are because the money hasn't been spent on social housing. The environment around social housing, especially the social housing built in the 50s and 60s, tower blocks, concrete blocks, whatever, which have not been maintained, not been managed, are not safe, have fallen into disrepair, have become sink estates for troubled families. These places are not places in which young people deserve to be you know, rid of. It's a bad environment. So yeah, you could blame it in that respect, but the root cause is, a, is, is political. It's social and it's economic. The environmental element is a result of cause of those three elements failing. systematically failed to look after people with, um, with, with challenges, mental challenges. Um, there, are, there has been a, a, a closure, of, I mean a lot of the people on the streets at the moment are those with mental illnesses or have some sort of disability that um, so, some are you know, coming back from being soldiers for example in, in the Middle East. Um, some have a long term of mental, of mental illness which has, has not just not been looked after properly and they end up on the streets and a lot you talk to are not well and they will die on the streets because they're not being looked at by the society that you know, should be helping them. It's one of the biggest causes of concern I think at the moment in our society is mental illness and people living rough on the streets. The two are so interlinked that we need to sort that out immediately. social structures that are embedded in our society are ones that it is very, very difficult to turn around. It's like a tanker. You can't turn it around within two minutes. It takes a long time. I think something, for example, like um, now you went to a comprehensive school. I did. Uh, I think that was a great change in, in the 60s when they got rid of secondary moderns and grammar schools. Not all grammar schools nationally, but in the main they were changed into comprehensive schools, which meant that no matter from where you came, you were given the same opportunity. Because clearly there are young people from disadvantaged backgrounds who are in clever, incredibly clever and bright. They would possibly, or quite possibly, have gone to a secondary modern school simply because of their societal upbringing, because of their background, and were never given the opportunities. Now they have opportunities through that system. Increasingly through the, the, the Conservative administration, one can say that more grammar schools are being encouraged. So in a way there's a kind of a dissemination, just a sort of change again back to an old-fashioned uh, way of working, which I think is, is destructive socially. And so you know, one can go right back to those root causes of what, what is it that gives you an individual from a social background where it hasn't been easy, the chance of, of, of getting on, which is the same as somebody that's come from a wealthy middle class background, 
Well, it starts at school. It starts with opportunity. But it also starts with telling or helping parents to parent. I mean, it's assumed society, society um, that, that everyone knows how to parent, how to raise children, and they don't. Very few people, by obvious reasons. We've never done it before. You do it, you know, first kid comes along. Okay, get on with it. Whoa, what am I doing? Some don't know. Some just take to water like that. It's great. So I think there is a need definitely to help more in that area. So, you know, we're given, so that, you know, local authorities help or whatever, I don't know who should help. Perhaps it's a charity, perhaps it's a, a, phil a philanthropist, I don't know, um, somebody needs to take that by the, bull, by the horns and really kind of sort it out as a, as a, as a crusade. Only educated parents quite often end up rearing poorly educated children. Now, that's a sweeping statement and absolutely isn't always the case. It's certainly not the case. But it's, it's when parents do not understand the value of education, where they suggest to children that it's not important to go to school, it's not important to do your homework, it's just, it doesn't matter. If you get into that cycle, then clearly there's failure there. As long as parents, actually, whether they're educated or not, it's just real retreat, it's slightly different. Whether they're educated or not, as long as they understand the value of education and lead and, and allow their children to understand that value and, and help them understand that value, they will benefit their children enormously to get out of where they are up to the next level in societal value. We have to make decisions about how, how different society needs to be, i.e the lowest to the highest earners. We need to, be, we need to understand where, where that balance lies so that the lower end aren't disenfranchised from, the, from this end. But they'll always be the very rich and they'll always be the very poor. The question is, how closely can we bring them together generally in order to make life a little bit more equal? I mean, that's a much more left-wing policy, possibly. Um, but I think society has to ask that question of itself. You know, what is the right balance? Because we, we want entrepreneurs to be entrepreneurial because they bring value, they bring uh, jobs, you know, they, 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 they bring opportunity. And so we don't want to um, say, no, don't do that. We want to encourage that. But equally, we, we need to make sure that the, you know, the living wage, you know, uh, is of, of the right amount so that people can actually live in the society that they are in. If it's, if it's not a proper living wage, then what's the point of having it?